So we'll just talk about anything and uh, they'll edit it to make us both look smart. I decided I would actually read you how many institutions he's currently affiliated with. That that's, that's generally, really yeah, it's, it's, a, it's quite a feat. <laughs> <laughs> they do it every time. Co-director of the cancer program at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Chair of medical oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. That one's actually rather short and not so impressive. Uh, <laughs> Without any further ado, over to uh, Professor Dr. Ben Ebert. At the very basic level, cancer is caused by genetic mutations that are somatic, meaning they're acquired during the course of your life. And those mutations have to happen in a particular cellular context. Not any cell in the body can become cancerous, actually quite a small percentage of cells in the body can become cancerous. It has to be a cell that has the ability to copy itself infinitely. And it's not just one mutation, it needs to be uh, the sequential acquisition of multiple mutations. This is why it's so heterogeneous. I'm gonna try and summarize your talk. Cancer in general might fall in three categories. You're unlucky, you were predisposed and you're in an environment, or you're old. What's wrong with that statement? There is clearly predisposition in some individuals, not the majority, but more than we thought initially. So maybe 10 or 15% of individuals might have some form of predisposition. There are rarer individuals who have a massive predisposition mm. so great that there's almost a guarantee that they will get a particular type well, of cancer. What percentage is that roughly? It's fractions of mm. a percent, but, but a larger percentage of individuals with a particular type of cancer. So in younger individuals who are getting a type of cancer that is not typical of for that age, there's a, there's a, a genetic strong, factor. Yeah, strong enrichment for genetic factors in those individuals. And well, nearly always an environmental factor as well. That's a very difficult thing to quantify, and that is going to be very dependent on the type of cancer. Melanomas are riddled with the ultraviolet mutation signature. Clearly from, environmental. Clearly environmental. Many other kinds of cancers, including leukemia, not clear environmental factors, very minor environmental factors. One area of cancer research that's become quite prominent is defining the signatures of exposures. And the signature mean uh, an a genetic signature. A genetic signature. Yeah. And at some point you've accumulated enough of those mutations, you develop yeah. the... Or, or it's not enough of them, but uh, the wrong mutation in the wrong cell. Only a tiny percentage of mutations will actually lead to cancer. And, in, and most of those mutations will uh, occur in a cell that can never become cancer. So you have to have a mutation in one of the small number of genes that can actually lead to initiation of cancer in a, in a so cell. So that's it's, it's a time and statistics game. Yes, it's t exactly a yeah. time and statistics game, as is those with a big exposure as well. It just shifts the curve. On one hand, that's really complicated. On the other hand, it's a pretty finite problem now. So just in the last few years, due to advances in sequencing technology and the ability to sequence the whole genome. We know pretty much all the major driver mutations that cause cancer. We can analyze those in a clinical setting. So now every tumor gets biopsied and looked at under a microscope, but that's now getting digitized. So that's also digital information that can be analyzed. Radiology is now completely digital information, and all of our medical records now are all completely um, electronic. That substrate is now probably for the first time in history available and ready for really, really large-scale computational analyses. And since this is being done routinely on every cancer patient, the number of uh, cases is going up very fast. I think uh, the cancer genetics revolution is still relatively in its infancy. We have gone through the discovery phase very efficiently in the last five to 10 years, finding all the genes that are mutated, but we use a tiny fraction of that information clinically. There's a lot of information in that data that we just don't know we're how to use We're not acting upon currently. But since we're getting this information on patients at a clinical level and thousands and thousands of patients, that data is going to become available. And one of my goals from this talk was to at least convey to this community the opportunity of the size of the data sets. As long as the data's, uh, the data's labeled, we don't have to know anything about it. Right. Which is the beauty of it. We, we can train models That's as right. long as we've got the right labeling to come to the to uh, a particular conclusion, and then, and then you can, of course, use that model. And that's exactly. happened, I think, a lot with radiology. Non-experts have actually been able to do a better job of actually yeah. analyzing the image as long as they have a good train set. Pathology, which is also a fundamental aspect of all of cancer therapies done by a, a human and an eye, and now those 
slides are being digitized. I could have a, an AI system, machine learning system, analyze that exactly. and see smaller substructures that the human eye sort of glosses That's over. That's right. Or look at larger uh, amounts. So maybe you've got a large biopsy, yep. you take an entire chunk of tissue. You can't have a pathologist spend six hours per case, but a computer could do that. So this is a huge opportunity. And so the question is, in our bloodstream, are there little snippets of DNA with mutations that could be detected that indicate that that individual has a cancer hiding somewhere in their body or a pre-malignant lesion hiding somewhere in their body. One circumstance that looks quite promising is in patients who already had a cancer and have gone into remission, but we know already what mutations that patient had. We might be able to detect a recurrence faster by uh, mutations in their bloodstream than we would otherwise. Whether we can take the general population and predict who's gonna get cancer is a much, much harder problem an extremely important one, and we all hope it will work, um, but at least detecting relapses faster is, uh, is very much on the horizon. What's your great hope? So there's no question that immunotherapy as a field is an enormous part of cancer therapy. These engineered T cells are limited almost entirely by our imagination because we're truly engineering those cells. You want to explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so. that's a really fascinating field where we take T cells, which are immune cells, from a patient with cancer and engineer them to target that cancer. They're very complicated to uh, therapies to engineer, but in, as a whole, immunotherapy is an enormous Seems field. Seems right on track. So and what, gonna, what, why did it more recently come, become uh, successful when it was previously less so? It wasn't for lack of trying in the past that, that the previous uh, interventions didn't work. A smaller core group of uh, researchers stuck to it. A lot of uh, the great breakthroughs we make at Bell Labs are mm -hmm. people who were stubbornly convinced that it was the only answer yeah. and then persisted when all others were dropping away. That's absolutely fair to say that um, lots of people said, oh, you know, we've been down that road for decades. It, it, it always was intuitive that... Um, it, it feels right, you, doesn't Yeah, it, it feels right could, that yeah. if you could just stimulate the immune cells to, to, to do target it. a tumor, <laughs> then why, why wouldn't that yeah. be a good thing? But uh, all attempts to modulate the immune function ended failed. in failure only when we understood immunology well enough uh, and only when we could get the cellular engineering that worked well enough to do the CAR T cells uh, did we start to see efficacy. I think in general, cancer screening will be married to underlying predisposition. Some patients may have a uh, inherited predisposition to a type of malignancy. Some patients may have an acquired uh, predisposition due to a pre-malignant state. Those individuals that are much higher rate of progressing to an, uh, a full-blown malignancy are the ones that will try hardest to find the malignancies when they occur because uh, they're much more likely to change outcomes. So I'm going to connect now back to Bell Labs. Yeah. That's one of our goals is to actually understand the nature of people communicating, yeah. uh, but also the nature of people reacting to the environments right. and, and, and even the, how it has a physiological effect. Right. Uh, the role of continuous monitoring uh, and where you think that could go. There's tons of opportunity there, certainly on like the cardiovascular size or the cardiac function side. If yeah. you had a shirt that you put on and wore it for a while, rather than putting on a whole bunch of electrodes exactly. and wearing it in a big battery pack, that would be uh, uh, extremely useful. It would even be useful like when you um, start a beta blocker and your heart rate slows, uh, if you got the feedback that, that you know, you, you there's times of the day that, yep. yeah, that the heart rate is too slow, you need to modify the dose, um, other than just saying to the patient, oh, you, you know, how are you feeling taking the drug? It, the the can, old uh, self-reporting, not very exactly, reliable. Exactly, not yeah. very reliable. And uh, then in oncology and cancer treatment. Yeah. Tumor modification, that, tumor tracking. Tumor absolutely, tracking. you could be monitoring the actual tumor, particularly if it's superficial or with other mm -hmm. technologies, ultimately, I think getting the people who are designing clinical trials or, or experiments fully knowledgeable about what can be done with what, these. What techniques are available, and this is why we'll collaborate yes, on this, and absolutely. then magic will happen. Exactly. Well, thanks very much, Ben. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank thanks you. Thanks very much.